Hey, welcome back to the channel and welcome to the Travis Air Force Base Aviation Museum here in Fairfield, California. It's on an active military base. So you have to do a lot of, uh, go through a lot of security checks just to get to this museum, but it's well worth it. It's a very uh, cool museum with a lot of cool things like this one behind me. This plane here used to transport missiles from the Atlantic to England back in the day. So why don't you come with me and let's go check out all the other planes and memorabilia they got inside. All right. Okay, I found the board that tells you what it is. Okay, this bad boy is a Douglas C-124 Globe Master. Top speed of 300 miles an hour. It could fly up to 21,000 feet. And they flew only a couple years from 1959 to 1961. It transported missiles across the Atlantic to England. Transported missiles. Wow. And I imagine the front nose would come down and open up just like you, the modern ones, the back opens up. Now this one has got a huge wingspan. It's got these massive engines. As you can see, these are some big engines. See how big the propellers are? I'm gonna say this propeller is maybe 10 feet long. And the wheels alone. They got it all screened off to keep birds out of here from nesting. So you guys don't ever complain about buying your car tires. Can you imagine how much one of these cost? BF Goodrich. Silver Town. That is a huge tire. They still seem pretty good too. And it looks like they might fire these up occasionally because there's an oil stain on the ground there. But look how massive it is. It's like a three-story building flying in the sky. All right, I was going to see what other details we can read about this guy. This is the front landing gear. It's just a beast of a plane. You see how big this thing is? Look at how big it is. That, that wing right there. I would have, uh, it's like 25, 30 feet high, just the rear wing. It is a big plane. So this guy here is a AT-11. And it was a trainer uh, during World War II, a bombing trainer. And I'm not sure what the open portion was for. Uh, modifications include a transparent nose, a bomb bay, an internal bomb rack, provisions for a machine gun, for gunnery training. Students, uh, bombardiers normally dropped a hundred pound sand filled practice bombs. So that clear nose is quite interesting. Uh, and right here we got a Convair C 130D. This is a 
decent sized plane as you can see this one's pretty cool looking it reminds you of a plane that would be in a um, Godzilla movie North American F-100 Super Sabre um, a design that superseded the F-86 first flew in 1953 there you go Godzilla movie plane I like the lines on it now this would have been uh, if I am right about my aviation the MiG Russian MiG uh, would have been the competitor of this plane and there's a nice nose this is a F-102 Delta Dagger and that's a big plane wow the cockpit's up there but look how big the, the engines and you know what I'm noticing about the cockpit look at it it's a little it's uh, aerodynamic it's not round very interesting I think that had something to do with radar and you can hear a cargo plane taking off in the background it was an active base. Now this one has some kind of radar in the nose. And it's um, iridescent. McDonald F-102B Voodoo. And this um, doesn't say the years this flew. Uh, cruising speed 546 miles an hour and can fly up to 58,000 feet high. That's pretty high. This one always looks cool. I love the looks of this one. Looks like a um, North American F 86L Sabre. This one had a top speed of 692 miles an hour. For every 14 Soviet built MiGs destroyed, only one F 86 was lost. So this dominated the MiGs. Look at the rockets underneath the belly. And we got one here Republic F. 84F Thunder Streak. Top speed 685 miles an hour. Thrust 7,200 pounds. This is an interesting looking one. You know, and I'm walking around and I just noticed, look what the uh, stanions are here. Empty bomb casings all the way down. And they got a flush seven deck there. And this little guy here is, uh, no plaque. So I'm going to guess it's some kind of um, surveillance. Um, doesn't really say. There is a map in my pocket. I can see what it says. Okay, my handy dandy map says it is a U3A. A U3A. Okay, this one is pretty cool too. They all have a characteristic, a Lockheed T-33 shooting star. Top speed 600 miles an hour. And they were produced from 1948 to 1959. Shooting star. And they got the uh, cool logo or... I don't know the exact name of those that they just paint on the side, but it looks like it's got a cat 
firing a machine gun and an eagle holding a bomb. This one looks like it's been recently painted or restored. This guy here has a Douglas C-47 Skytrain and it says okie dokie. Okie dokie. Not a super fast plane. Flies at 224 miles an hour. It was mostly for uh, cargo. And let's see if it says... Uh, used it in the 50s. So it's just a transportation plane with cargo. The white and black stripes are interesting. Maybe that designates it's a cargo plane. And this is a Beach C-45H. The trainer. Small little guy. Nothing too impressive about it. But a neat, basic plane. It is probably very reliable. Kind of like a DC-10, I guess, back in the day, which were extremely reliable planes. Okay, this bad boy is a Douglas A-26K Invader. Invader was a twin-engine light bomber attack aircraft built by the Douglas Aircraft Company during World War II. It saw extensive use in the Korean War, targeting railways. I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of these Gatling guns up here. These look like 50 millimeters. And it looks like they're doing a little paint job, a little restoration on it. Got some um, big propellers on that thing too. Probably um, was for the speed of it. Now this one here is like a flying boat. You see the bottom? And they got the red line up the cabin to warn you about the propellers. Especially when you're landing in water because they could come close to you depending on how far it sank. It's a Grumman SA-16 Albatross slash boat. It was used mostly for the um, by the Coast Guard for search and rescue. And to see if it says anything else about how old it is. It doesn't, but I'm going to say, again, probably 50s, maybe 60s. And it looks like they're working on restoring it, too. The guy that drove me out here told me they, they get all allocated uh, funds to repaint and uh, work on these planes. Um, three a year so that's what's going on here okay so this guy has got some interesting things that the other ones don't I wonder if these are weights it's got stainless steel um, on the wings any aviation experts watching this video, what, what is that about? And let's find out what this bad boy is. 
Fairchild C119 Flying Boxcar. I imagine with a name like that, it was mostly for cargo. Yeah, designed to carry cargo personnel and equipment. And uh, it was made from 1947, and the last ones were built in 1955. Pretty neat there. Okay, here we are. So this legendary plane is a Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. And it looks like Jake could have been in control in that seat. So the specifications, the wingspan was 141 feet, the length 99 feet, the height 29 feet, top speed 327 miles an hour, and uh, used a right engine, a R3350, horsepower 2200. The B-29 Super Fortress represented a state of the art in bombardment technology of the 1940s many of today's modern military aircraft systems can trace their origins to the b-29 designed as a replacement for the b-17 flying fortress the b-29 incorporated modern advances in aviation technology no longer were the bomber crews exposed to freezing weather while attempting to fight off en enemy fighters the V-29 featured pressurized crew compartments, remotely controlled gun sights, and sophisticated radar that enabled the B-29 to bomb through overcast conditions. So this is the beast. And you can see the livery there. Miss America 62. But underneath the belly had um, two uh, machine guns, probably 50 cal. And then these uh, massive engines. Whenever you guys watch the old World War II movies, um, they usually have a plane like this in the movies. Delta May. But a uh, pretty wild looking plane for its time. And um, this plane was, like I said, connected to um, dropping the the um, atom bombs. This is that plane, no, but a similar design to this plane. And this would be the bomber's site to dial in the exact angles and speed and all that. On a little bit of a side note, I am not an expert in this stuff, so I'm learning also so if i'm making mistakes in my descriptions i apologize in advance but i'm learning through reading the signs and my own curiosity okay so more guns in the back and this would rotate all the way around and the guns in the back i don't know if you can see it but there's a huge um yellow jacket up there and then the glass siding back there that that looks like it would be bulletproof glass pretty thick so it's got a lot of defense so if they're being attacked you'd have one guy back here I uh, imagine looking through there aiming this you guys, some, someone down there aiming. 
and um, you know if if you if they saw one of these coming towards um, they knew that it was going to be dropping bombs so they definitely was a, a huge target to get this thing out of the sky tires still pretty big still pretty full of air and I'll go under here and get a little closer view so there's no yellow jackets this is under the um, probably a lot of hornets nests around here the landing gear a lot of this looks like it's in good condition though And look, I'm just noticing how close the propellers are to the ground. It's only about eight inches off the ground. Crazy. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even notice this up there too. It's got a machine gun on top too. It's got below, top, and then the sight would be up there where the guy would sit. Got to stand back to kind of get the whole view of this thing. Super fortress it was. And um, the little spiky things on top. I don't know what those are. So uh, please let me know in the comments what those above the bombs it's possible those are atom bombs. Possible. And a guy giving me a ride over here, he told me that the le if you look at the serial number and you look at the letter on the end, that's a designation of basically the model. So A is the first one of its kind. And then going forward with all the um, other letters in the alphabet, the higher they go the different design or more improvements it had and i can see two japanese flags on the side too okay look at this thing this is an oddball spirit of fairfield sassoon vacaville military air transport service it is just a a weird one just like the other one we were looking at before I wonder if it has a weird name, too. So it's a Douglas a C-133A Cargo Master. I wonder what the nose cone is about. It says, Cargo Masters went directly into production. There were no prototypes built. The first cargo master flew on April 23rd, 1956. And the first C-133As were delivered to the military air transport service on 1957. And it looks like there was uh, 50 of them. And they were used during the v Vietnam War to deliver um, cargo. So that is a big plane. A weird looking plane, but a big plane. Got the landing gear up here in the front. A couple horns. I guess that's to tell you move out of the way. And another plane that's got really tall wings. The wings are on the top of the plane. That, that way there's no interference with the amount of cargo it can hold. You see how high up they are? I'm not sure what this big thing is here. I see uh, some landing gear under there. But why does it bulge out like that? I have no idea. 
Again, look how tall the rear wing is. And a little tiny rear wheel. That's a big one. Definitely. And this one right next to the giant cargo plane is an Air Force Communications Service. And it looks like it was designed for long range because it has a huge fuel tank. Look at the size of this fuel tank. And it's got double jet engines on each side. So I imagine it was good for some pretty high speeds and could fly pretty high also altitude wise but look at the difference of the the nose of this thing just fits right under the whole engines of this giant cargo one pretty crazy Okay, this is another beast of a plane. You see the giant fuel? It's got literally uh, four jet engines, two on each side of the aircraft. And I forgot the name of this on the read the board there. But this is another cargo one. It's a B-52D Strato Fortress. And they were, for, what did they rely on the Strato Fortresses for? They were actually used at this Air, Air Force Base. And uh, they flew bombing missions. So I'm wrong about being a cargo plane. This is a bomber. And flew bombing missions and in the Vietnam and they were um, first flown in 1952 October and then they used them all the way up until 68 so this is a uh, bomber I was mistaken but I always um, as a kid I remember seeing pictures of these things and I always thought they looked kind of cool Kind of aerodynamic and now that I've gotten older I'm learning a little more about what they do but when you're a kid you're just looking at things that think are cool one of the things I'm noticing right away is look at the landing gear it's got four wheels up here and four wheels in the back so the the wheels are matching the uh, engines Oh, and it's got an end of the wing wheel too. Wow. You know, when you, you don't really realize all the little details of these things until you start walking around and looking at them. This is pretty cool. Look at that, it still rolls. Can you believe that? The bearings are still good. You know how long this thing's been sitting out here? A long time. And underneath the rear, I'm just going to look at that. These, I don't know what they are. Again, I'm not an expert. This looks like some kind of tow hook. These are uh, some kind of wind speed. No, it's not wind speed because they don't have the little catchers stabilizers maybe maybe when they open the bomb doors here's the inside here where the landing gear would fit I got all this anti-bird netting I guess the birds would get in there that thing looks like it has a turbo on that thing whatever it is I think those are for when those doors are open during flight to stabilize the plane That's what I'm thinking.
And the last thing to show you is these uh, four guns in the back. Again, the enemy would definitely want this thing out of the sky so they wouldn't uh, get their bomb load dropped on them. Okay, this one got a camo paint job, which I would assume Coco 22 was an army plane just by the paint job. So let's go take a look, see if I'm right. And it's chained down. Fairchild C-123 Provider. This little guy over here has got a really cool look to it. The Lockheed C-56 Loaded Star. Um, similar to a passenger plane. But um, I like the, the, the nose of it. And this one, you can kind of see the engines too, the rotary engines in it. And the wheels on it are nice and shiny. I wonder if this one has been restored recently. Kind of looks like it, huh? This guy here is a um, another plane. Don't know what it is yet. I'll let you know when we get up there. But it's the last of the outside planes that I will show you. And then we're going to move inside the museum. Pretty big plane. And there's one more over there. Douglas C-118 Lift Master. It was designed as an airliner. Using the same wing as the C-54 and the C-18 fuselage was lengthened and the aircraft was re-engined with more powerful 2500 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R-2800s. So this little cute guy here is called a C-7A uh, Caribou. Short takeoff and landing utility transport. You see the nose has hinges on it, so it must have opened up. All right, and off in the distance, you can see the live planes because this is a live military base and i'll do a panoramic and we're going to head inside so this is a model of the plane out there on the tarmac this is cool this is like a, a dashboard for a plane I'm not sure what, you know, when I was in um, middle school, believe it or not, I had a math teacher that was an ex-military pilot, and he taught us some aviation. So, if, if I was in a do-or-die situation, I might be able to figure out how to fly one of these things. But this was your... You had, you definitely know to ha had to know your um, orientation. Other bad things would happen if you didn't. It's a nice little display they got here. These look like uh, probably male planes, grasshopper, Piper Cub, famous Piper Cub J3 Cub was the grasshopper. This is an interesting map. An airman's airline. It shows where we are. And then, of course, the Hawaiian Islands, and the Philippines, and Guam, 
New Guinea, Australia, all the flights all over the place. Here's the other half of the uh, display they have here. Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Oh. It says here the Air Force party suit. I don't know what they mean by that. Um, the party suit was originated with the U.S. Air Force fighter pilots in Thailand during the Vietnam War. They were worn on base only for special occasions. So I don't know which one of these is a party suit, but one of those is. And here's a great uh, display here of this plane here. For Forward Air Control Vietnam War Cessna 0-2A Sky Master. It's got a really detailed of the engine, which is awesome. Store. Now this guy was obviously an active um, fighter with all this different um, armaments on it. And we got a paint job here on the wall. These would spin to the ground. MK-82 Snake Eye is one of the series of low drag general purpose bombs which are collectively known as the mk-80 series bombs you know the technology of war and all that all the interesting things they developed is interesting but war itself is horrible and you can think about that thing killing people a lot of people I wish um, the human race would figure out how not to have war. Maybe when we're all dead and gone in a thousand years from now, um, this planet will be a more peaceful place. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. This is a great little view. It's got a helicopter flying away. Very good. Um, little setup they have here. Some great photos here they have on the wall of people being greeted after uh, you know, POWs that got out of their cell, a bamboo prison cell. Uh, six years as a POW, can you imagine the, the uh, horror of being in those kind of conditions for six years and the treatment you get. Um, but here's them greeting the daughters and waving and good stuff. Free at last. For those of you that are of the younger generation watching this, um, try to appreciate what people have done for this country that you live in. We sacrificed a lot for this great country. Now there's a gun that you would not want to be on the receiving end of. It's a General Dynamics M61A1 Vulcan. It was capable, you ready for this number, of firing 6,000 rounds per minute. 6,000 of those giant bullets per minute. That is insane. Here's a little bit of a air crew. You get a survival knife, a couple landing water, first aid kit. That's all you got if you were crash landed. And here's a bunch of um, currency collection of currency showing where 
and, uh, where someone has been so is like your ability to tell a story where you've been. This guy would use to carry is a glider that could carry 13 troops in their equipment or a jeep. And this is the front of one. So it would be designed to just land and um, bring troops or jeeps to the appropriate areas as needed. This is the engine room. Wow, look at that. That's cool. Massive engine. General Electric TF39 turbo fan. That's a big one. Eleven thousand pounds up in ways. Pictures of people working on them back in the sixties. That is a big one. And what we got here, this is a Pratt & Whitney TF-30. F-14 used it. A-7 Corsair. Aardvark F-111. Or F-111, if that's what they called it. This is a Soviet engine, a MiG-29 engine. Soviet technology. Engine VK-9, Russian. Pratt & Whitney J60, little tiny guy. It's a B29 propeller. And what do we got here? This is, looks like a rotary. A right R3350 duplex cyclone. Chrome propeller is nice. Pratt & Whitney R4360. Major Wasp. So these were in ooh, Flying Wing. And it looks like the B-29. And some big planes, and as well as a uh, fighter plane. Powerful engine, I imagine. It looks uh, very large. We got four cylinders here. It looks like a rotary with maybe 16 or 20 cylinders. Uh, it says 28 cylinder, four roll rotary. That's definitely unusual. But these are little tiny ones here. More rotaries. This one on the wrong side. This one is a cutaway. I'll go to the other side and show you guys what that's about. It's a flywheel and a gear uh, crankshaft power mount. This is a piston. So, for those of you that don't know anything about how engines work, this goes up and down, and it, when it goes up, there'll be a little mist of gas that'll be squirted out 
up here and the spark plug would be up there and that would create a spark and an explosion would happen and it would force this, the piston, down. And it would turn this crankshaft. And they would all do that simultaneously. That's uh, engine 101. Another cutaway, same story here, big piston. Um, to elaborate a little more, once the explosion happens, you have to get rid of all the, the explosion gas, and that would, the piston would go back up, and then a valve would open and it would push it out of the chamber, and then seal it up again, and those are called valves. And here's a valve that I'm talking about right there. So piston would come up, this would open and allow the exhaust gas to go out. Then it would go down again, another one would open and allow fuel to come in. Then a spark plug, this would be the fuel right here. Spark plug would explode, it would push down and turn the crankshaft. That's basically how an engine works. And we got some more Jets here, Pratt & Whitney, Pratt & Whitney J57 and the T34 Turbo Wasp. And that's an interesting looking jet engine too. This is a General Electric Allison J33. And then the thing in the center here, it says Town Dog. This thing with the nose right there. One of the big lessons of World War II was the hazards to fly over targets were bombing. That set off a search for strategic weapons that could be launched from a distance to strike a target. Um, for its defenses. Development of a Hound Dog is designed to carry by a B-52 bomber, one under each wing. The first operational missile was delivered in September 1959. After takeoff, each missile's engines were started. This would make sure they work. And then the missile said, wow, this was a self-guided missile. And this, I imagine, was the guidance system. Could be wrong, but self-guided missile attached to a B-29. So if you had to fly over enemy territory, and you did not want to get shot out of the sky, you could launch this missile. And that big aluminum thing on top, I don't really know what that is, but it's pretty cool. There's one there. Putting teeth on the hound dog. Flight control electronic computer. Do you see this? If you took your cell phone out and you cut it up into 20 pieces, one of those little tiny pieces would probably be 10 times the amount of power of this giant computer. Now here's an interesting one here, as well as here. It doesn't really say what it is. But this, this kind of seems like a rocket engine to me. Yeah, it's like honeycomb. And now there's a fan. Wow, a fan. Another early rocket engine here. Rocket engine prototype X-15.
over here is a Titan uh, Titan 6 rocket Elon Musk eat your heart out Titan 6 rocket here and you definitely don't want to be on the receiving end of this blast and here's a little trainer that lets you crawl into if you want to pretend you're a pilot this model is really cool it's a landing the lunar landing and someone made a detailed model of what the astronauts dealt with going to the moon and back pretty neat and this is the view if you were sitting in this little capsule going to the moon on the top of the rocket hoping the rocket doesn't blow up they have believe it or not they have an old fire truck here part of the museum cool looking fire truck 1942 this plane here Cessna UC-78B Bobcat. And if you see that little red um, part of the picture, that's this. From a Boeing um, B-17E. It crashed into the mountains of Southern Oregon in 1942. It was found in 1953 by a tro troop of Boy Scouts. Radio transmitter for a B-17. Another one. This is uh, showing you the bomb loading devices that they would use to put the bombs under the wings. And here's one right here. And you know this is a, a fat man that um, was detonated over Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. So close to today, because I think today is, I'm going to look at what day it is. Oh my god. I didn't even realize it. I swear to God, I had no idea, but it's the same day. August 9th. Yeah, we're here checking this thing out. And this is a uh, diagram of what, what insides were. Plugs. On August 9, 1945, at least 40,000 persons were dead or missing. Control plugs and radar antenna on this bomb served the same purpose as those in Little Boy Bomb. But the 10,000 pound Fat Man Bomb was designed to use a more active nuclear principle. An ordinary explosive crushed a hollow sphere of plutonium into the beryllium pol polinium core if I'm saying that right setting off the reaction So I just got through seeing the movie Oppenheimer. And this is what the movie was all about. Scary stuff. So back to this. 
This is exactly, uh, it's August 9th, 1945, and today is August 9th, 2023. Let me do my math. 55. 55 plus 20 is 65, 75 plus 3. 78 years ago, today, this bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. This type of nuclear weapon, which was designated over Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9, 1945, which was the second and last time a nuclear weapon was used in warfare. Its 23 kiloton yield equal to 23,000 tons of TNT caused two square miles of dev devastation and approximately 45,000 immediate fatalities. <sighs> it's hard to even read. Fat man used an implosion detonation method. 5,000 pounds of high explosives surrounded a ball of plutonium 239. When the explosives were detonated, the plutonium was squeezed inward, causing an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction. This complex detonation method was tested July 16, 1945 at Trinity Site, New Mexico. The length of it is 10 feet, 8 inches. It weighs 10,000, almost 11,000 pounds, and 60 inches in diameter. And the Trinity explosion is the one that you see in Oppenheimer, the movie. I must admit, it's a kind of an eerie feeling standing next to this thing because you know it's just, a, you know, an empty shell. But imagine this little device killed thousands, 45, and now we know a lot more than that from the radiation. 200,000 people or more. And imagine the technology that we have now. So let's pray that none of this stuff ever happens in this world. Otherwise, our planet might be doomed. Some more examples of some bombs here, too. General purpose bombs. Blasting charge. Um, arming wire, double suspended, auxiliary booster. Um, so I guess it depends on the size of it and how much TNT was in it. Crazy stuff. There's some more shells down there. Self-protection electronic jamming pods used by the Air Force and Navy in various versions provided protection to aircraft for jamming different, different frequencies. Huh. I've seen those in war movies before. Hughes Aim for Falcon. It was the first operational guided air-to-air -air missile of the United States Air Force. So this is the first guided missile. Some more great models here. Some are painstakingly made. Did a great job whoever did that. There's a B-2 bomber, flying wing, Blackbird, SR-71. This is a great little model display here. And here's some um, going my way. Memphis Bell, flying fortress painting. 
Another one there. This is the history of nose art. And if you look up there, home stretch. I wonder if these are the actual parts of the plane. Home stretch. Let's see what else we got here. Little mic. Snack time. Final objective. I like the final objective one. It's sexy. And we got some more down here. There's a big thing here of nose art. I'm just gonna pan it. If you guys, you know, wanna pause the video and read it, please do. Now they have a little section here that talks about um, military in the movies. And look at this old poster. James Cagney, Gary Cooper. Operation Starlift. Please don't touch. This is like a little training thing, I imagine. The link trainer. Learn how to fly with instruments. Okay, I'm not sure why this is here, but it's cool. Yeah. Now this is what it's like being in a C5 plane. And there's a lot of room here, and a lot of controls to know what they do, up and down. And we got a female co-pilot, it's good to see. This guy does navigation. I'm not sure what this guy's doing, he's like trying to hide I guess. This is all about the Japanese here. Caps open war on US. I imagine that is a kamikaze um, flag. This is interesting. This is a piece of the Berlin Wall. You know, they got this corridor here and there's some really interesting photos. Coal rations for one week. Inside view of aircraft. And down below, a happy boy thanks to Operation. Got some Hershey. And this one missed its landing. This is a uh, plane that crashed in the residential. Another accident that is pretty bad. These are people that have died. Daily food for Berlin.
This one caught my attention. Look at the look on these women's faces. Look at the meat in the window. They just wanted to feed their families. And you got a children playing there. West Berlin policemen at the borderline of the Soviet sector are leaving the American sector. They look intimidating enough to me. These women look like they built an airport. They then had to move thousands of cubic meters of earth to build the landing strip. That was a chore of Berlin. Berlin would have starved if Americans in Great Britain had not sent them aid. Look at that little girl. This woman chops remnants of a tree that once shaded the street for fire for his stove. That's how, and look at the bombed out. bringing home some warmth. Look at the background. Wasn't that long ago, folks. No electricity meant no news on the radio. The truck delivered uh, the news. It's a sound truck that would play the news for people. In freezing cold apartment, reading paper, darning socks and doing homework. No coal meant no heat. Teachers and students wearing coats in a cold classroom. Plane coming to help. This is all after the war. This is what drags behind the plane. And that is a fueling nose, I guess. And this caught my eye here. Air re refueling boom. Interesting stuff, huh? This is all the air refuelers. This museum really did a great job on all this stuff here. These patches are cool. All over people, they encourage you to mail your patches to them. So the docent was kind enough to uh, give me a ride to check out one last plane that is, you can't go unless you get a ride because this is on the active military base part. But this is a C, uh, C-141 that was brought here in 1965, which is the year I was born. And he said they were used all the way up until 91. And originally it was painted like a frog, he said. And um, what else? It has up at the nose there, it's got a re refueling pod. And they made it a little longer. Uh, it's called the Golden Bear, as you can see. But this is an impressive cargo plane, too. And again, I'm not going to read all that to you, but it's just, what a great view that is, huh? You don't get to stand next to an aircraft this big unless you come to a museum. 
and then you can do that. But otherwise, no. But quite a impressive aircraft, as you guys can see. And I'm just gonna do a little lap. The guy said he'd wait for me. Very nice docents here. And as you saw in the video, there's like no one out here. It's, it's kind of mind blowing that they don't um, have more people. But again, it is an active military base. Look how big the wingspan is of this thing. But it's quite impressive. And the guy, the guy, if you can hear the truck there idling, he's the docent. He gave me a ride over here, very kind of him. And um, like I said, you do need to get a ride to the museum and you need to get a ride back. So just uh, be warm, but look how, look at the size of his wings. That is a big boy. I bet it looks neat at night. They got all these lights to light it up. All right, that's the last plane of the day. Hey everyone, thank you for coming along here today at the Travis Aviation Museum on the active Travis Air Force Base. As you can see, there was a ton of stuff to check out. And I hope you enjoyed it, for you history buffs. If you are in the area, I just wanted to point out that you have to have, if you have a real ID, there's a visitor center you got to go check into first. Then you will be um, given a ride to the museum. You can't just drive here. If you do not have a real ID, it's really important that if you have a regular ID and another federal issued ID um, or document. So a social security card or um, a passport or something like that. And it's all on the website, but the first time I came here, I didn't have the right documents and they turned me away. So I just want to give you guys a heads up. So thanks for coming along with me today at the Travis Museum. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you on my next journey.